Good morning and welcome to the service of worship with the congregation of St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. My name is Mark Schaefer. I'm the senior pastor here at St. Matthew's and on my own behalf, on behalf of all the leadership of our congregation, it is my privilege to welcome you to worship with us this morning. Today is a day in which we will explore the meaning of God's grace. We will explore the cost of God's grace and we will explore the, ability, the availability of God's grace for us and a hurting world. So wherever you have come from, whatever you believe or doubt, whether this is your first time with us or your 500th, you are welcome here. I invite you to join in reading in the call to worship, which is found in the worship materials, which you can access if you're viewing via Facebook live stream in the link, in the description of the worship video. Come to Christ, that living stone rejected by the world, but in God's sight chosen and precious. Seek to be built into a spiritual house, a living reminder of God's presence on earth. Once we were no people, but now we are God's people, called out of the darkness into God's marvelous light. Therefore, we sing with the church in all ages. Blessed be your name, O God, our Redeemer. By your mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I invite you to join in singing our opening hymn, Come Sinners to the Gospel Feast, number 339 in the United Methodist Hymnal. continue by reading our opening prayer. O Lord, our God, you are always more ready to bestow your good gifts on us than we are to seek them, and are willing to give more than we desire or deserve. Help us so to seek that we may truly find, so to ask that we may joyfully receive, so to knock that the door of your mercy may be opened to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
This is that time in our worship where we lift up announcements for the good of the congregation. Are there any announcements that need to be made this week? Good morning. Sunday school for our children will start today at 1130. If you registered, I have sent, sent you the Zoom information. Today will be an introduction class and lessons will begin next Sunday. If you would be interested in teaching over Zoom, please get in contact with me. Also, youth group starts tonight. Uh, we'll meet in the parking lot from 4 to 6 p.m. I would love to see everyone, so I hope you've made plans to attend. It looks like it might be cool, so don't forget a jacket. Uh, we will be outside the entire time. I will have registration forms if you do, have not registered online. And remember, four to six, wear your mask and bring a friend. Are there any other announcements that need to be lifted up at this time? Yes, George. Um, keep a watch out on your alerts for information on being able to join the Zoom services for Wednesdays and Sundays. That information will start coming out next week. Okay, so, now. so keep your eyes peeled for announcements for the ability to participate through worship, um, through Zoom in worship, that information will be coming out this week. So um, that will apply to both the Wednesday and the Sunday worship. So we have been testing this with in increasingly larger groups of folks, and it's going to be thrown open to everyone. Um, and I'm excited about this because this will be a way for people not only to interact uh, more directly with the service, but with one another as they watch uh, to create times of fellowship both before and after the service. Are there any other announcements that need to be lifted up? If not, then will you join with me in a time of prayer as we join together in reading our prayer of confession? O oh God, source of all that makes life possible, giver of all that makes life good, we gather to give you our thanks. Yet we confess that we have often failed to live our thankfulness. What we have, we take for granted, and we grumble about what we lack. We have squandered your bounty with little thought of those who will come after us. We are more troubled by the few who have more than by the many who have less. Forgive us, O God. In this hour of worship, accept our thanksgiving and teach us to make gratitude and sharing our way of life through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news, that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love for us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us share in signs of Christ's peace with one another, both by either greeting those sitting next to you at home or by entering comments into the live stream feed as we watch together from a distance. Peace be with you. Now's the time for our joys and concerns. Uh, we are asking for continued prayers for Reverend Glenn. A joy happened yesterday. We celebrated my sister-in-law, Jackie Hallahan's 80th birthday. It's nice to see family from a distance. Please pray for all the people and animals in the path of the wildfires that continue to burn and spread. Suzanne requested prayers for her friend, Lisa Hansen, who had surgery on September 16th. The Glory Ring, Gloria Ringers would like to thank ringer Pat Layfield for the beautiful mask that they're wearing today. The mask features a bell motif. The bell choir is making a donation to the Bowie Food Pantry to thank Pat for this gift. Um, and we also just received word that Ruth Eicher is back in the hospital. We're asking for prayers for her. She had back surgery on Monday, came home Friday, and had to go back last night. Um, she's having some leg problems, so we're asking prayers for her. Also, prayers for Justice Ruth Bader, Gins Bader Ginsburg's family and for our country. Thank you.
Will you join with me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, we gather this morning as your people to reflect upon your word, to receive your inspiration, to come together in community, to bear one another's burdens, to celebrate one another's joys. And so, O oh God, hear us as we lift up these prayers to you for those who are sick, for those who are in need of healing or medical care. We think especially this morning of Pastor Glenn, of Lisa, of Ruth, of all those who are in need of healing in the flesh. We pray that they might find that healing, that they might be treated by professionals whose hands are guided with skill and compassion, that they might have access to the resources they need, that they might find comforting and supportive community to aid in recovery. We, of course, think of the many thousands afflicted with COVID, the many more who will be afflicted in coming days with flu and other illnesses, and pray for their healing. We pray, O oh God, for those who experience brokenness within, brokenness of heart, of mind, of spirit, those who struggle with loneliness and isolation, those who struggle with anxiety and depression, those who struggle with other illness that we cannot see. We pray too that they may be treated by practitioners who are compassionate and caring that they too might have access to the resources they need, that they too might find supportive and loving community to aid in their recovery and healing. We pray for all those who experience the brokenness of relationship, families torn asunder, friendships that are strained, and we pray for reconciliation and healing. We pray for peace in these relationships, even if they do mean parting. Lord, we pray for all those who experience the brokenness of the world, an environment that seems ever more precarious, disasters ever more extreme. We pray especially for those out west facing devastating wildfires. We pray for those in the path of hurricanes, for those living in drought, for those wondering where their bread will come from. We pray for all those who are in experiencing the brokenness of our social order, those who are in communities riven by poverty and strife, those who fear the violence of their neighborhoods, those who face on a daily basis ongoing systemic discrimination and violence those who live under oppressive and unjust systems, those who through no fault of their own have been sidelined in our economic system and who struggle to pay for food for their families. We pray for healing in our social order, O oh God, in need of redemption now more than ever. And we pray, O oh Lord, for all those who grieve all those who face the brokenness of death. We pray especially this week for the Monroe family mourning the death of Betty. We pray for Ruth Bader Ginsburg's family and the nation that grieves her death. Lord, we lift up all these things to you, not out of a vain hope, but because we know that the brokenness of the world, our illness, our spiritual brokenness, our relationship brokenness, our social brokenness, even the brokenness of nature, even the brokenness of death does not have the final word, but you do. For we have seen this in the life, death, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose life we saw healing and reconciliation, in whose death we saw solidarity, and in whose resurrection we have hope for our own. And so it is that we are able to pray all these prayers to you in the name of Jesus, who while he was yet with us, taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in our worship with hymn number 372, How Can We Sinners Know? complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare for what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat. 
and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in the reading of the congregational response. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Then God brought Israel out with silver and gold, and there was no one among their tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. He spread a cloud for covering and fire to give light by night. They asked, and he brought quails, and gave them food from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock, and the water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. So he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. He gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the wealth of the peoples, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Please join me in singing the gospel acclamation. Alle, alle, alle. Your words be our prayer and the song we sing. Alleluia, alleluia. Alle, alle, alleluia. Alle, alle, alleluia. Alle, alle, alleluia. Alle, alle, alleluia. This morning's gospel reading is from the gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out at about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said there to them, Why are you standing idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last, and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last work only one hour, 
and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this the same as I give to you. And am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us. This morning, I wanted to show you a little something about God's love. So I've got two pieces of paper. One I've written us, and one I've written them. As you can tell, the us is bigger because well, God loves us more, right, than them. Yeah, so, and that's how it is. God loves us more. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, now them is bigger than us. Oh, hmm. I don't, I know, I, don't, I think God loves us more, right? Well, look at this. If you bring them together, they are the same size. Because God loves us and them the same. We are equal to God and he loves us the same. See, what I said before was not true. God loves us and them the exact same. God's grace is not dependent on what we do. He has poured his grace and love out to all of us. Can you think of a time that maybe something wasn't fair? Or maybe you didn't think it was fair? To be honest, things don't always turn out fair. But there's a twist to that. And we can be thankful that things aren't fair. That's God's grace. In the gospel today, Jesus tells a story that didn't seem fair. So, but he's going to help us understand it. Because some of you may think that the outcome was unfair. In, a, in the parable, a landowner went out 
early in the morning and hired some workers to work his land. Now they agreed on how much they were going to get paid. It was all done before they came to work. And then a little later, he went out and hired some more land workers. There you go. And then a little bit later, he hired more workers. So this tells you when they worked. Some worked all day, some worked uh, half a day, maybe three quarters, some worked one quarter of a day. And then still, right before work was going to be over, he went out and hired some more workers. And they worked maybe one or two hours. So then at the end of the day, he paid them. And he started with the ones who just worked one or two hours. And do you know how much he paid them? We're going to just use a number. It says a day's pay. We're going to be generous. They got paid $10 for just working one or two hours. It's a pretty good deal. Well, what about the people who worked a quarter of a day? Well, they got paid $10 too. Yeah. How about half a day? That's a lot more than one or two hours or a quarter of a day. How much do you think they got paid? Yeah. They got paid $10 too. And then these people who had been at work all day long, how much did they get paid? You guessed it. They got paid $10 too. Now, does that seem fair to you? These people worked all day long in the hot sun and they got paid the same as those that just worked one or two hours. Well, those first workers, these people that worked all day started complaining and saying that it was unfair. And the landowner said, friend, I haven't been unfair. We agreed on the wage before you started. And have I not paid you that? So take it and go. I decided to have to give the one that came last the same as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? The landowner was being very generous. A generous person is someone who is unselfish and kind, who gives freely, abundantly, and with good will. Hmm. Sometimes when we start complaining about what others have, and maybe we don't have them and we see it as unfair, this story teaches us not to be envious of others, but to remember the generosity of God's love, which is offered to everyone regardless of how worthy they are. We see God's generosity everywhere in the world. Think about the beauty of a sunrise, all the birds and animals, the ocean and the mountains, wildflowers growing in fields. Think of all the people that love you and care for you. Think of your friends. The generosity of God's love is rich and overflowing and is offered to each one of us and to them. Let us pray. Dear God, Thank you, Thank you for being so generous to us. Thank you for Jesus, who teaches us how to notice what you offer to us. Thank you for loving us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see everyone today on Sunday School or Youth Group.
One announcement that I forgot to lift up earlier uh, in the service is that we are asking you to continue your pledge from last year, from 2020, at the current, at, at the current 2020 level in 2021. The Finance Committee is attempting to put together a budget for the coming year, um, and since the, the pandemic has disrupted the normal method that we would use to evaluate that by a pledge drive and so on, we're simply asking members of the congregation to maintain their pledging levels from the previous year into the coming year, and this will help us to do our financial planning. So if you can make that commitment, I encourage you to go to our church website, uh, St. matthews buoyorg slash pledge and indicate there that you are willing to maintain your pledge through 2021 and that will help greatly in our planning. Will you join with me in a moment of prayer? And now, O oh God, may the words which are spoken and heard and in our lives enacted be faithful and true and touched by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my father is a retired art teacher, having taught art to middle school and junior high students for the better part of four decades. And in his career, he was greatly committed to education. You might say too committed, since not only was he teaching full time, but at one point he was serving as the vice president of the school board in the district in which we lived, and as the president of his teacher's union in the, te in the district in which he taught. So even though he was simultaneously involved in management on one district and labor on the other, he always had a heart for the labor side. And he endeavored to share that perspective, a teacher's perspective, on our school board. I learned a lot from my dad about the work of a teacher's union. I learned a lot about contract negotiations and grievance procedures and other union-related issues. I learned about the astonishing power of an alternative to striking called work to rule, in which teachers do only the work that their contract calls them to do. It's a sobering thought to learn that if teachers do only what we pay them to do, the entire school system slows down almost to a grinding halt. That school districts, and by extension all of us, rely on teachers to do more than they get paid to is a sobering thought. But one thing that I have learned from my unionist father, in addition to all of that, is that he hates the parable we just heard read from St. Matthew's Gospel. In the text, uh, Jesus is describing the kingdom of heaven as being like that of a landowner who goes out early in the morning and hires some day laborers and promises them the daily wage for that work. And they agree. And then he goes back at nine o'clock and finds more laborers and tells them that he will pay them whatever is right, which could also be translated as whatever is just or whatever is fair. He goes out again at noon and at three o'clock and at five o'clock in the afternoon and finds laborers who've been standing idle all day in the marketplace and hires them for the final hour of the day. And when he's over, he has the manager line them all up and pay them in reverse order. And to the ones who'd worked an hour, he gives an entire day's wage. One denarius. And now those who'd worked the whole day, when they arrive, he also gives them a day's wage. Just one denarius. And they're outraged. These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Now, it's not hard to see their point. I mean, especially if we update the money, right? Because the average wage in the US for a day or for an hour is $11.35 an hour. That's the average wage of all United States workers. So given a 12 hour work day from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., a daily wage under this system would be $136.20. So when the laborers who worked only one hour get $136.20, you can imagine the math that's going through the other people's heads. Those who'd worked longer and hired at 3 p.m. are thinking, oh, that's $408.20 for me. And at noon, it's $817.20. And at nine, it's $1,225.80. And those who've been working all day are getting a whopping $1,634.40. $1 that's almost CEO money. 
Well, it would have been in 1965 when CEOs only earned 16 times more than employers. Today, that would be $36,093 for one day's work, but I digress. <laughs> now, even if they don't expect the 136.20 to be the hourly rate, basic fairness, you would think, would give them something more than that. And so when you have a higher number in your head, and the manager hands you $136.20, you feel outraged. This is why, as a union guy, my dad hates this parable. But the landowner's response is interesting. Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me to take the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this to the last, the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? And then Jesus concludes the parable by saying, so the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So what on earth is going on here? Are the laborers right to be upset? Is the landowner being unjust despite his guarantee that he will pay what is just or what is fair? Now, as I mentioned last week, we don't know that much about St. Matthew's identity. We don't know much about the author of the gospel that bears his name. The prevailing consensus is that it was written by a Jewish Christian, likely in Syria, probably in Antioch, to a congregation that identified strongly as Jewish Christian. The gospel's emphasis on Old Testament prophecy, its organization of Jesus' teachings into five books, if you will, of teaching akin to the five books of the Torah, its insistence that not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished, shows a concern with the continuity of Israelite tradition into the emerging Christian one. But while Jews may have been the first Christians, they were not the only ones. Fairly early on, Gentiles, Syrians, Greeks, Arabs, Ethiopians, and Romans were drawn to this new faith and to the message of the gospel. And much of the early debates in the early church centered on how to treat these folks. The question was, in order to become a Christian, must one first become a Jew? That is, is Christianity a sect within Judaism, or is it something perhaps overlapping with Judaism. According to the book of Acts, this question was settled by the Council of Jerusalem, who sent a letter to Gentile converts in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia that read, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose upon you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So there you had it. You didn't need to become a Jew to become a Christian. That is, you didn't need to get circumcised. You didn't need to observe to keep kosher food. You didn't need to observe the Sabbath or the other holy days. You, nearly, you merely needed to abstain from idols, food with blood in it or that hadn't been properly slaughtered and from fornication, which might be another reference to idolatry, since that is frequently the way that word is used in the Bible. And you can imagine some of Matthew's community saying, wait a minute, that's it? <laughs> Abstaining from idols, blood, and fornication, and they're in? We're praying three times a day. We're fasting. We're keep eating only that which is kosher. We're observing the Sabbath. We're having our male children circumcised. We're offering sacrifices, observing the festivals and the days of mourning. And we're treated the same as these Johnny-come-lately pagans are? How is that fair? What is just about these folks who've shown up at the very end being treated the same way as those of us who have been doing the hard work all along? Now, when answering the objections of the community in this way, you could fall back on the contract identified in the parable. Hey, you got what you, you, got what you bargained for. What do you care whether I give away my money to other people? But the bigger point of this is that 
all of the laborers are beneficiaries of grace. None of these laborers is on staff. All of them were in the marketplace looking for work. When the landowner came by, all of them received the benefits of gracious invitation by the master, an invitation freely given. See, we're so suspicious of grace precisely because it's freely given. For years on campus, I, I would table during winter finals with a big table in the campus center full of all different kinds of chocolates, bowls of chocolates, usually uh, different kinds of Hershey's Kisses, the milk chocolate, the dark chocolate, the almond, the peppermint, the candy cane, the caramels, you name it. And then usually a big bowl of Reese's peanut butter cups, which always went faster than everything else. And then, you know, the mixed little uh, mini crackles and all that stuff. And there was a sign in front of the table that would say, spiritual therapy for finals, free chocolate. And some students would snag a piece as they walked by, almost as if they were getting away with something. Some would come by and say, what do I need to do to get the chocolate? And I'd say, nothing. It's free, help yourself. I'd even bring my laptop and I'd sit there and do work and appear as disinterested as I could so they wouldn't think I was about to pounce on them and make them commit to Jesus or anything. Finally, I placed another sign on the table that said, free chocolate. If you had to do anything to get it, it wouldn't be free, would it? <laughs> free grace seems to be such a hard concept to get our heads around. And St. Matthew wants you to know that God's grace is free because we keep forgetting that. So we might imagine that grace is given to somebody else. We like to imagine that we are in God's grace because we earned it. See, you see this all the time in our social and our political thinking, where people will talk about how they themselves lift themselves up by their own bootstraps, by the way, which is physically impossible if you've never noticed, but they neglect to mention that they received an education in, say, public schools, or that they went to some private school that I'm pretty sure their parents paid for. Everything I got, I earned. Everything you got, well, that was a handout. So this attitude is epitomized by a comment made some years ago by a reasonably well-known actor who was objecting to social welfare and government aid. And he said, you know, I've been on food stamps and welfare, and did anyone help me? No. His oblivious to the fact that food stamps and welfare are other people helping him is right in line with our inability to see ourselves as having received just as much grace as those we think are getting by too easily. And here's where Matthew's community might have gotten off track. Because they're thinking that they've earned grace because they've been following the law all this time, all the pagans have often been worshiping other gods and so on, that they have forgotten that the law itself is the response to a grace already received. So the Israelites received the law at Sinai after God liberated them from Egypt. Not before. The story of the Exodus is not Moses bringing the law to enslaved Israelites in Egypt and saying, follow all 613 of these commandments and God will get us out of here. It's the story of Moses bringing the news to the Israelites that a God they barely even remember is going to deliver them from captivity for the sake of a gracious promise that God had made to their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That promise itself was given freely for God's own reasons. And God continues to show grace to the Israelites, providing them with food and drink in the wilderness for their needs before and even a single letter of the Torah is revealed. What this means is that the observance of the law has never been a way to earn grace. It has always been a way to respond to a grace that has already been given. And it's the same with us. We're so inclined to believe that our own merit and that our own ability to determine our own destiny is there, that we miss the abundant grace that we have already received. St. Matthew wants you to know that God's grace is free 
Because it's only when we understand that that we allow ourselves to be recipients of grace and that we are freed to extend grace to others. We cannot share that which we have not received. If we do not count ourselves as having received grace, it becomes harder to share it with others. It's only when we have come to see just how dependent we are on God's grace that we become vessels of grace for other people. In so doing, we see, we change, I should say, how we see the work that we have before us. It no longer do we need to feel that we're pressed by the demands of discipleship. Because we toil in the vineyard, not because it's how we receive God's grace. We toil in the vineyard because God, we have already received God's grace. We toil in the vineyard because there is work to be done, and in so doing, we work alongside those who've been with us in the struggle from the very beginning, and those who've shown up only just now, all fellow recipients of God's grace. We toil in the vineyard because doing so is a testimony to the master who graciously extended the invitation. And so doing responds to the words of that same master who said, blessed blessed are the servants whom the master will find at work when he arrives.
Gracious God, we give you thanks for these gifts. Grant that they may be dedicated to your service, that we as your people may continue to build communities of grace in which we acknowledge that which we have received and freely give to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn today is Amazing Grace, number 378 in the hymnal. now as we go into the world, a world in need of grace, we go acknowledging that we ourselves have received it, that we might more freely share it. And so as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit go with us now and always. Amen. <laughs>